We're moving on now from the ISX 2250-2350 to the X15. Now the X15 still has technically the 2350 ECM on it. Remember when we talk about 870, 570, 871, 2250, 2350, that's referring to the electronic platform or the ECM platform. So when we went to the X15, the engine's significantly different than the ISX15 CM2350, even though it's an X15 CM2350. And then going forward from here, we would end up with the X15 CM2450. And we've got a couple 2450s. I saw one. I haven't had a chance to open a hood on it. So I won't be doing the uh, introduction to that engine for a little while yet because I just haven't seen one yet. I don't have much reading material on it. It's Everything's getting more and more hush-hush these days. So the X15, uh, very different than the 2350. We're going to take a look at the photos now and see why. It has the UL2 uh, SCR system on it. We'll get into that in other videos, but just know it's got the UL2 system. Thanks for joining me. Let's take a look. Okay, first we'll be looking at the driver's side of the engine. Number one, the fuel pressure sensor. What's different about it? It now has a secondary backup sensor in it called the rationality sensor. It runs about 1,000 to 2,000 pounds less pressure than the main rail pressure sensor does. And the ECM uses that to decide if the rail pressure sensor is lying to it or not. Number two is the TVR, Throttle Valve Recirculation. And that's to, you'll get a better picture of that in, uh, in another uh, shot in a minute. That valve is to recirculate hot fuel with cold coming in fuel. Why? Because we're filtering at between 3 and 4 microns on the filter and 10 on the frame. And in cold weather, we're having problems, the potential problems for filter plugging just because of the cold and the small pore size in the filters. Number three is your data plug where you can connect to the engine and you can calibrate it, do any functions you want with software. There's also a nine pin in a cab. There's a lot of stuff that talks on a nine pin these days. So three's a good bet. It's a private, just, just you and the engine when you're on pin three. Four, this engine and all the X15s have a throttle valve on them. It's a great big butterfly in front of the intake and it controls the charge air coming into the engine. They do that to uh, fine tune EGR, to make the J brakes more effective, to make takeoff from the starting line a little bit more responsive because this is a um, 605 horse engine with 2,000 and 50 foot-pounds of torque. Not all of them are. This one is. Let's move on to number five. Number five is your intake pipe for the air compressor. Notice that it doesn't go up to the intake. It goes around the front of the engine. See it swinging around up there by number eight? It goes all the way to the other side of the engine. You'll see where it goes to. They, did, they made this change because they wanted zero soot going into that air compressor, and they finally solved that problem. And it was a nightmare for them, believe me. Number six is the insulated tube from the valve cover taking crankcase gas into the drip housing number seven. Notice I didn't say filter. There is no filter anymore. And they insulate six, and right below the tip of six there is the crankcase pressure sensor. Seven, again, is just a drip housing. That line coming straight down off of seven, the backside of seven, that goes down. That's your oil return. It goes down to the side of the block. Number eight, I just, this is actually the fan hub. I just put, uh, wanted to make a note of that because this has, this is a magnetic, magnetic, 
fan hub drive. So it uses air to lock up, but it has permanent magnets in it. And those magnets, when the engine's idling, keep the fan running, I'd say at probably 150 RPM, maybe 250. And it's enough that the air conditioning uh, doesn't drive the fan on and off constantly. Now we're going to move up to number nine. And it's just an air filter. This one happens to be supplied by the OEM. Uh, they're going to a new cartridge type air filter. You put them on. You don't change them till you reach your mileage interval. Or your, uh, if you've got an air minder indicator on it, when it tells you that it's restricted enough to change, they don't want you taking it apart, looking at it, putting it back together because it just causes dirt to get in there. It's pretty much a one-stop deal now. Cummins makes their own that you can buy for the engine assembly or the OEMs have them as well. And when they put these engines in an OEM chassis, the, the OEM gets a, a, a book from Cummins that tells them everything they want them to do chassis-wise, including air filters and other things, so the, it enhances the engine's reliability in life. Number 10 is your uh, OEM ECM plug. Notice those, those have uh, bolts the ECM is actually uh, has threaded bosses in it, and those 96-pin plugs are bolted down fast. Now, they're locked into the ECM with levers, but the harness comes back, and they bolt the harness to the ECM, so there's no vibration of the wiring there, because it's a pretty stout harness. 11 is a fuel pressure restriction sensor. That's OEM, and it's on the um, primary filter on the frame. 12 is the new heat shrink fuel lines. You can hear me just happy about that. Well, I, I do have to admit, Volvo started using these around 2000 and I'm going to say 7-ish. And they're really pretty reliable, but uh, I had a couple of them that leaked and they were buggers to find. We ended up smearing axle grease uh, because it was thick and tacky all over the line where it, where it went onto the fitting. And that's how we figured out which lines were leaking. Uh, 13 is your line going back, your return line going back to the tank. And that's the driver's side of the engine. Moving into the next slide, it's a kind of a close-up. Uh, let's go to number one. That's your uh, TVR thermal... TRV, thermal recirculation valve, and that manifold up there, that number two is bolted into, and number two is a fuel return line. That is, a, and so is number three. That is, that, that manifold is the fuel return manifold. So you've got two, three, and four. Those are your return lines. Two happens to be from the uh, rail dump off valve. Three's from the injectors and four's from the injection pump. And then valve one is just a thermostat that opens and shuts a passage and it lets the fuel recirculate to the incoming fuel or it uh, sends it back to the tank. Six is, you can barely see six, it's kind of hidden. Six is your oil, I believe that is the pressure sensor back there. It's either the pressure or temperature. It's behind the steel line, the steel line with the fitting on it. That's your air line going back to the air tank from the air compressor. And then number eight is your, your suction line coming up from the tank. And you see number seven, that's another uh, thermal valve, but it's an OEM to let return fuel either get mixed into the filter or go right back to the tank. And they're doing all this because of filter gelling in cold weather. And it's a problem because the micron ratings of the filter is getting so small to protect the fuel system. So you've got uh, more problems with, with um, filter restriction in real cold weather. But the payoff is if you keep that fuel system clean and change your filters the way you should and don't open up those lines if you don't have to, and when you do cap them, your injectors and, and pump last a long, long time. They've got them down. So now it's almost really up to you how well your fuel system is going to be. So make sure whoever does your fuel system or your services, your fuel system maintenance or your services, they understand what they're doing and how to keep things clean. Cleanliness is, 
of the utmost importance because a fuel pump and a set of injectors are probably pushing 12,000 bucks with labor. So uh, spend the money, get a guy that's good with the services, knows what he's doing. We'll talk another in another video about uh, taking care of the fuel system properly. So let's move on to the next slide now. Okay, uh, this is that throttle valve I told you about up on the front. The blue hose is the charge air pipe on the driver's side front. Number one is the motor that drives the throttle plate. It's kind of in the back. I wanted you to see it. Number three is where the butterfly is down inside that housing. Number two is the connector that plugs onto the back of the motor. And good luck getting that unplugged. Uh, number five is the drip housing for the crankcase breather. And number six is the vent off of the drip housing that goes down to the ground. And even though there's no filter in there, virtually no oil comes out of it. If you look to the left of number two, those two steel lines are the fuel lines coming up to the rail that supply the rail pressure. Remember, the fuel pump now has two completely separate pumping chambers, so if one fails, the pump will still continue to make pressure on the other so you're not stuck on the side of the road somewhere. If a steel line fractures, well, you're done. One of the high pressure lines, but I really haven't seen that happen yet. Okay, this slide is the passenger side of the truck looking down from the top and that rubber boot on the top right corner is the air inlet from the air filter. And number one is a newly designed compressor housing on the turbocharger. And number two is the pipe that sends air over to the air compressor inlet. Remember I told you when you look at the air compressor inlet that they solved their problem with carbon? The clean air comes right out of the turbo. And that pipe number two goes up to the, the big housing that holds the Freon compressor and alternator. And it has holes a hole cast through it. And the pipes go up into it with O-rings. So that's your design for the uh, clean air to the air compressor. And notice how uh, everything is, there's no hoses there, so you don't have to worry about it blowing out or sucking dirt. So it's a good design. Number three is just a coolant vent out of the EGR cooler. It comes out of the top corner there. It, that's kind of a new design. And that steel line in front of it is the um, going in the exhaust manifold is for the exhaust gas pressure sensor. In this slide we see number one, this is an X15, it's 605 horse, and this is 2,050 foot-pounds of torque. So this is a, one of our heaviest haulers. Uh, number two is the, the crankcase pressure sensor. Remember that used to be up in that housing when it had a filter in it, but now they moved it into the pipe because there is no filter housing, just a drip housing. Number three is where the uh, crankcase pressure comes out of the valve cover. Number four is the harness that goes over to the camshaft sensor, which is bolted into the gear housing now instead of the side of the head. Okay, looking at our next slide here, this is the newly designed fuel pump. Number one is the fuel actuator. Notice they move that right in the front. It used to be in the back on that aluminum housing. That aluminum housing is gone. They got rid of that. This actuator bolts right into the front of the housing. Number two is one of the pumping chamber heads. Uh, those are a serviceable part you can replace. It's the As long as the cam is good and the tappet's good, you can replace that section if your pumping element seizes or fails or there's check valves in there that could fail. Number three is just a block off. I think they do this because on some industrial engines, they run the fuel lines out of the side instead of the top, depending on the options. This makes the pump more versatile. Their goal is always to have the fewest amount of part numbers to do a, a job as possible, which certainly makes sense to me. Five and four are the high pressure lines that send fuel from the pump up to the common rail at about 30,000 PSI tops. This engine idles at about 8,000 PSI. If this was an X12, I've seen 36,000 PSI in an X12. So the pressure's just phenomenal. 
I know there's oil all over the pump. That's another video. Now there's something different about this photo than you've seen in the other photos of the other engine. So I'm going to see if you can figure out what that is while I'm yakking about this. Number one is the new, uh, new style VGT. Haven't had any problems with any of them yet. Number two is the new cover. Remember the wires used to go down into the housing through a rubber block. They had so much trouble with water getting in and damaging the boards that they put this cover over the top of it now to keep water out of it. So that was a great improvement um, that they did. Number three is the inlet knock sensor. Remember the inlet knock sensor, even though it's at the outlet of the turbocharger, it's called the inlet knock sensor because it's the inlet to the after treatment system. Number four is a coolant line. The VGT and the turbo are water cooled. They've cut down on the water, the amount of water lines to this. They, they incorporated one line into another. So they're trying to make, make the engine look less like a spider web of lines and wires and hoses. And did you figure out what's different? If you look at the inlet knock sensor right behind it is where the injector should be that injects fuel for the after treatment. But there isn't one because this engine doses the DOC after treatment catalyst by firing the injectors on the exhaust stroke, just like they did with the ISC and the QSL. They now have got it down to the place where they can do it on the X15. They didn't do that originally because if they had excessive regeneration of after treatment, they would end up with fuel in the oil. But this system runs like a well-oiled clock. Thanks for joining me on Neural Splendor.